The scripture for this morning is uh, taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 5. And it says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. I am fully aware of our time right now. <laughs> so I will try my best to have this message to be truncated enough, but giving plenty of time to let the Holy Spirit speak to us. So I feel impressed. Um, God has been blessing me tremendously throughout this week. And with all the stuff that's been going on in our local church with Pasadena and some personal things that's been going on in my life, I think this is a very perfect opportunity to turn our eyes to Jesus. Could we sing the song, just the refrain, Turn Your Eyes? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory Dear Father, as we enter into your word, Father, I am nothing but dust. Lord, I'm not worthy to hold a message such as this. But thank you, Father, Lord, that I have an opportunity to be clothed in your righteousness and that I could hide behind your cross and it's only through you that you'll be speaking, but not me, a sinful person that I am. God, us as we learn more about your truth, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today's message is entitled The Investigative Study. Um, majority of the times when I try to find a message to preach on, I honestly want to find a message that I don't personally have a grip on it. Most of the studies that I do, most sermons, most messages, I want to delve into it so I could get the real meaning of that doctrine or that truth found in the Bible. And so I was wrestling with what to speak about, and it came to this idea of the investigative judgment. How many of you have heard of that term before? Are you okay with the understanding of it? Are, are you 100% sure of what this message is all about? Do you know? And so I, I wrestled with this, and it made me realize this started when I first got into ministry. I had a friend in Orlando that when we, um, before leaving to go to theology, I had a friend who was raised up in the Adventist faith for a very long time, since he was a baby. He went to academy, academy he went to school, everything. His whole family was an Adventist, but he never really claimed it as his own. And so he went on this journey of trying to understand the Adventist faith. And so he got all the resources together and started learning about the truth. He started learning about the Sabbath. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Sabbath is, is a beautiful thing. The seventh-day Sabbath is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. He started learning about the state of the dead. Wow, they're only sleeping. They're not going to heaven right now. They're not hell they're just sleeping, waiting for a soon return. And he started learning more, and he started accepting more and more, but he came to two obstacles. One of them was the fact of Ellen White. He came to Ellen White, and he was so confused. Why do these pastors keep preaching more about Ellen White rather than Scripture? Seems like they uphold her higher than the Bible. And so, he didn't know much of where, what resources the Adventist church has, 
So he went outside the Adventist church, outside of Adventist Book Center, and went to a Christian book, found whatever they had on Ellen White, and he made that as the truth. They had information such as she's a plagiarist. They called the Seventh-day Adventist church as a cult. They called uh, Ellen White to be someone who went through hallucinations, that it wasn't divinely inspired. And that started tripping him even more. And then it came to this study that we're going to delve into this morning, the investigative study. He had the idea that if he didn't fully, truly remembered all of the sins that was going on in his life, he would not be saved and he will be blotted out of the book of life. But is that true, brothers and sisters? Is that true? I serve a God, I believe, who is loving, righteous, and truth, full of truth. And in this message, I found that God is a God of love, amen? And so as we go through this study, I hope this gives us a bigger picture and another puzzle to the peace that will make us understand that his character is not of hate, not wanting to condemn us, but to ask us, turn, turn away from your evil. So this message is a message of love. And many people think judgment is negative, but it is really of love. And I hope through this study we'll get to understand that. Do you have your Bibles? Pull them out. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. If you have your Bibles, I highly encourage you. If, you're, if you don't have your Bibles, if you're just listening with your ears, you might get lost. So make sure you're grounded in the word of truth. So turn with me to Hebrews 9, verse 27. For us to understand this, we have to do a little foundational work, okay? Say amen when you have it. Hebrews 9, verse 27. Amen? All right, this is what the Word of God says. Hebrews 9, verse 27, and it reads, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the the judgment. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. This might be kind of hard to understand if you're not very spiritually discerned. took me a while to understand this verse, but it's telling us that judgment is critical. So critical that everybody, what did I say? Everybody will face judgment. Even those who have passed away. There are stories of people in the Nuremberg trials of how Hitler and his Nazi regime was going for judgment. And to escape this judgment, do you know what they did? They killed themselves, thinking that they will escape what they will have to face for mass genocide. But we see here, Scripture is telling us very clearly judgment is critical. Even, af- even death, we cannot escape judgment because the first person we see, if we pass away, do you know who we're going to see? Jesus. And so judgment is for who? Everybody. Following so far? Now let's go to Romans 3. Tw- um, you don't have to go to it. To, for the sake of time, Romans 3.23, what does that tell us? For the wages of sin is death. So we learned judgment is for everybody. We cannot, fi- uh, we cannot run away from it. We cannot um, hide from it. We will face judgment. And in our state, we, le- we learn Romans 3.23, for the wages of sin, for, I'm sorry, for, um, for we have all fallen short of the glory of God. So if picture with me with this. We are sinners. Because of what Adam and Eve d- did in the Garden of Eden, we have taken a step back. For we have uh, all fallen short of the glory of God. So we have taken a step back. And now what's going to happen with us? Wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Amen? 
And so we see, just like what Brenda said, as a promise that we hear over and over again, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So get with me. Judgment is for everybody, but our current condition, we are supposed to die. That's the only thing that we're supposed to get. So we have a step back. But through Jesus, for God so loved the world that whosoever, everybody, we have a choice. We have an opportunity to take a step forward. Amen? That even though we are sinners, even though we are wretched, and you may think that you're not worthy to be in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus gives us an opportunity by trusting in him and believing in him, we have an opportunity to step forward. Following along, so, following along with me so far? Amen? Clear as mud? <laughs> Turn with me now to Hebrews 10. Go, go back to Hebrews, Hebrews 10, verse 38 to 39. So G, um, we are sinners, take a step back, but with Jesus, we have an opportunity to take a step of faith and be saved. Hebrews 10, verse 38, amen? Okay, and it reads, now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Verse 39. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Let me read that again if you haven't caught it yet. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but those who believe to the saving of the soul. Of the soul. So according to this verse, to give you a little commentary for us to understand, we took a step back because of sin. And now through Jesus, we have an opportunity to come back to him, take a step forward in faith. But there are two options for us at this point. We could either continue stepping forward, walking forward in faith, allowing God's light to manifest in our lives to learn more and more truth about Him, or we cannot accept that faith anymore and take a step back. Do you understand me? So we have an opportunity to continue moving in faith. That's why we're here. That's why we're in Sabbath, in church, to learn more about Him so we could learn about Him and share to others, or your heart is getting colder and colder. Your heart is becoming more like stone and more truth that you hear, more things that seem very relative. You take a step back and not want to hear this truth anymore. So there's two options that we have. We profess to be Christian. Now we have an opportunity to keep moving forward or to go back. Turn with me to 2 Peter. This will become more clear. 2 Peter 2 verse 20. We're going to go through this quick, so go quick in your Bibles. Two verse, 2 Peter 2, verse 20. Amen? All right, and it reads this. For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Pay attention, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. And in verse 30, 22, it reads, But it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own what? Vomits. So continuing, continuing along what we have learned, just building truth upon truth, we are all going to face judgment, right? And since we are sinners, we are taking a step back. But Jesus allows us to take a step forward. And so we could continue walking forward, learning more about God being sanctified in His truth, or we could take a step back and not care about who God is. And He is nothing but relative. I'll just follow what the world calls me to do. And so... Peter is telling us we can go back. Some people will go back 
to their own vile vomit, which is sin that we have professed to go away with. Do you see what the situation is? Some of us can go forward. Some of us could go backwards. So what does this tell us about judgment? I hope you're following along. It's telling us that God honors our freedom of choice. Does that make sense? God honors our freedom of choice. It's not once saved, always saved. Because if once saved, always saved, what's the need of judgment? God gives us this opportunity to follow him, to be dunked into pools of water, be baptized and profess that we're Christian and to have eternal life that he promises or to go back on him and believe in what everyone else believes outside this church, outside this world and believe in social relativity and all these other things that are very, very shaky. So God gives us this freedom of choice. We have the ability to choose before Christ and after Christ. Amen? So even after we profess to be Christian, you don't have to be Christian after that. That's why you have to continue moving on in faith, learning more about God through the Bible. So if you get with what I'm trying to get now, before the end of the world, there has to be a final determination who has accepted the blood of Jesus or not. Are you following along with me? So we see we have two choices after we become confessed Christians. We could continue on or not follow God anymore. So God has to make a decision. God has to seal us. If we made this decision, stick with it. Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't be in between, but we are lukewarm. We want to be maybe, yes, no, uh, I don't know. God wants us to make a firm decision in whatever we do. In the end, it's our choice. So there has to be some, si some type of inquiry, some type of investigation to reach a verdict. That's what judgment is all about. Look at the definition of judgment. You come through your evidences. You investigate to reach a verdict. So God has a day, or a, not a day, but a time where he will inquire and he will investigate. And in the end, judgment, God is not going to pronounce God, God is not going to force you to do anything. In the end, it will be our decision. Are you following along so far? In the end, God is not going to force you. Revelation 3, it tells us he is ever patiently knocking on the door, just waiting for us to open the door so we could come and dine with him. He will dine with us. God is giving us a choice. And in the end, in judgment, it will be our choice, not his. So we are going to learn about the investigative study. This is not an exhaustive study because you'd have to go into the cleansing of the sanctuary, Daniel 7. You'd have to go into, um, you'd have to go in the sanctuary message and what Jesus is doing, 1844, just give you a little synopsis. We could do another sermon on this or ask me in person. 1844 is a last time prophecy, 2,300 years. And 1844 marks Jesus moving from the holy place to the most holy place. And in there, he has the books open, Daniel 7. He had the book of life. You have the book of remembrance, and you have the book of sins. Those who are professed Christians are in the book of life. All the good deeds that you have done is in the book of remembrance. All the bad acts, even from you being by yourself in your room, from the things that you do in public, all of them is being recorded. Great Controversy tells us angels are by our side recording everything that we do. Is your money being used for, for God's glory? Is your talents being used? Is your gifts, 
Are you wasting your time? God is recording it all. And so we see God is investigating all of this so that it will come to judgment, come to a verdict. But there is a dilemma. Turn with me to Psalms 139. Open your Bibles to Psalms 139. Psalms 139. Amen? And it reads, Psalms 139, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways, for there is not a word on my tongue. But behold, O Lord, you know it all together. So according to chapter 139, verse 1 and 4, what is that telling us about God? God knows everything, right? So here's our dilemma. If God knows everything, God knows when we sit or stand. God knows when we go to the farthest, most right farthest most left if we go to the upmost highest to the heavens to the downward areas to the caves god knows we what we what we're doing and god knows what we are going to say god is omniscient he knows everything but yet why does he call us for judgment why does he investigate our lives? Why does he have the books open if he already knows what we're going to do? If he already knows who we are, even to the numbers of our hairs, why does he need judgment? Are you following along? And here's my proposal, and I truly believe, believe that this is biblical. If God knows everything, then that must mean judgment is not for the edification of God. Judgment is for the edification and to benefit and inform us. Investigation is all for us to understand that God is righteous, God is true, and God is a just God worthy to rain down verdict and judgment in our lives. Are you following along? So judgment is not for him. He knows everything. He knows everything that we do. It's more for the fact of us being informed of who God is in our lives. Let's look. There's a pattern that I want us to go really quick. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. This is a very popular story. You've heard this before. In fact, there are so many theological truths and messages you could find just through the very beginning of when Adam and Eve sinned. I find that amazing. Genesis 3, verse 8. It reads, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord got, called to Adam and said to him, what does it say? Where are you? If we learn from Psalms 139 that he knows everything, why is he asking a question? He's investigating the situation. When you ask a question, why are you asking a question? To receive an answer to get an answer to your question that you don't know. Not usually when you ask a question that you already know the answer, unless you're trying to probe a situation or trying to make clear of what's going on in the person you're asking. I'm, I'm, are you following? So he's asking, where are you? He already knows. Verse 10, so he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Verse 11, he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should eat? Then the man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Blaming. She, he's blaming. 
And he goes to the woman. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? We see here in Scripture, God is investigating it. He's making it very obvious that he is probing the situation. He is investigating the, what Adam and Eve has done in order to enact judgment. So before judgment, there needs to be an, an investigation. And there's a pattern all throughout Scripture. So we see here God is asking questions to understand the situation so that it could let Adam and Eve know that he's investigating, and that he is open, that he is true, he's righteous. And right after verse 13 is judgment. Do you see that? Verse 13, verse 14, God is enacting judgment on Satan. You will crawl. You will have enmity between man and woman. To the woman, you will have many pain, you have many sorrows, and to the man, you will have to work and labor in the dust. Are you following along? Let's look at Genesis 4 verse 9. 4 verse 9, it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He's asking the question to Cain, What have you done? You look at verse 6. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you shall rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. God investigating the situation. Cain, what is it that you have done? What's going on? Why are you angry? Why is your countenance different? Verse 10, and he said, What have you done? The voice of your bl brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And then from verse 11 to 15, we see judgment being placed. God investigates the situation. He is being very obvious. He's being very blunt. He's being very open to let us know that he's investigating it so that we can be informed of what he's doing so that judgment can take place for us to realize that he is just and righteous. Let's now turn to Genesis 6, verse 5. This is the flood. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was ev only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creep, uh, man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We see here he's investigating. He came down and what, did it, what does it say? He sees. He sees what's going on. He doesn't need to see. He knows everything. But he allows us, he investigates, he intentionally takes a visual inventory and makes it obvious that he is seeing so that he, we can be informed that he is investigating before he judges. And we see in the, in the flood scenario, Mo Noah pleaded, get in the boat, get in the boat, and only his family were saved. We see a pattern. And then let's look at Genesis 18. Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18 and verse 20. And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and... See whether you have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. 
We see here God is investigating the situation. God is trying his best to get so many people to follow in his ways. In fact, Abraham was trying to intercede with God. If you find 50 that are righteous, will you not destroy the city? I will not destroy the city. 45, 40, 35. If there is at least 10 people, will you save the city? I will save the city if there's 10. So he investigates it. And if you look throughout the story, he sends two angels and the depravity of, sin, uh, of, of God was so great. There was so much sin that as those two angels went to Lot's house, people came by and says, who are these two people that I may know them carnally? They were wicked men. They wanted to know angels more than just knowing. And so in that very deep scene when everyone is trying to berate Lot's house, they get blinded and the angels say, Lot, you and your family, get out. I am going, there, God is going to enact judgment and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Just don't look back. And sad to say, someone looked back. And so we see here, God in, investigates, then he judges. God investigates for us because he knows everything. He investigates for us so we could be benefited with the knowledge that God is just and he is righteous and that he is open. Nothing is done behind closed doors. He is doing it willingly and obviously for us to understand that God is love. Are you following along with me so far? Amen? So God is love, and he wants to do everything before he enacts judgment. And if you look at Jude 7, for the sake of time, you could look that on your own. Jude 7 says, Sodom and Gomorrah is set forth as an example for eternal fire. So everything that we have learned from Genesis, from Adam and Eve to Noah to, um, to Cain killing Abel to Sodom and Gomorrah, all of this as a, is a pattern for us to understand that what happened in the past and how he enacts judgment is exactly what God will do for the end times. God is enacting investigation right now, opening the books, looking into the depths of your heart, looking everything that you're doing, and weighing out whether this man or woman will be saved in the kingdom. And we know that he is doing it justly, and he will only bring those who not only profess to be Christian, but continue moving on in faith. Amen? We will fall. We will go back. But if we continue standing up and moving forward, we will be saved. Amen? If we trust in the Lord, whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We see here this judgment, this pattern, reveals that God will enact judgment. He reveals what he is doing so that the world knows that he is righteous and he is purposely making himself open so that he is predictable that when it happens towards the end and we know the end is coming soon, we will, mean, we will not be taken surprise of how God will enact judgment in our lives. But there is someone who is trying to thwart that plan. There is someone who is trying to attack us to get us not to follow God but to go and take a step back. Who is that, my dear friends? Satan. Revelation 12, verse 10, it says, the accuser of the brethren. As Jesus is investigating our lives right now, as he is opening the books, seeing who Rodney is, seeing who pastor is, seeing who you are, he is investigating, but yet Satan is presenting evidence that this person has no business in heaven. He is presenting all of our dirt. Hear this from great controversy. While Jesus is pleading for the saints of his grace, Satan accuses them before God as transgressors. 
The great deceiver has sought to lead them into skepticism to cause them to lose confidence in God, to separate themselves from his love, and to break his law. Now he points to the record of their lives, to the defects of his character, the unlikeness to Christ, which has dishonored their Redeemer, to all the sins that he has tempted them to commit. Because of these, he claims them as his subjects. The arch deceiver hates the great truth. He hates the great truth and brings to view in a, that brings to view an atoning sacrifice and an all-powerful mediator. Satan, not your friend, not your best friend, nor someone that we should kick it with. Satan is accusing us, embellishing all these lies that makes us feel good, and in the end, he is doing his duty to get you away from God. We see here that as God, Jesus is investigating for our lives, Satan is accusing us of all of our sins. Pastor Rodney, how could you say that he's going up to the kingdom of heaven? He's lustful. He hates doing your word. He preaches on this pulpit, but yet when he goes in the innermost room, he is doing that, and you are going to save that guy? You're going to save that woman? You're going to save that person who she only thinks about herself? That person's a liar. How could you save that person? That person's a murderer. Satan is accusing us for our dirty sins. But praise the Lord, we have hope. Amen? Though Satan is drilling us to the ground, though he is pointing all of our sins and make us more embarrassed to the fact that we don't even want to be seen, we don't even want to be looked into the eyes because we are so embarrassed of our sins and our wretchedness, our dirtiness, our vomit. We have hope found in Scripture, 1 John 2 verse 1, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Amen? Jesus Christ, the righteousness. And in our scripture, Revelation 3, verse 5, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Amen? Though Satan is accusing us, Jesus, found in John three sixteen was sent so that whoever believes in him, we could take a step forward and continue moving on in faith, knowing that if we believe in Jesus, we will be saved. Great controversy tells us of this hope. Jesus does not excuse their sins, but shows their penitence and faith and claiming for them forgiveness. I love this. He lifts his wounded hands before the Father and the holy angels saying, I know them by name. I've graven them on the palms of my hands. Amen? As Jesus is investigating, as Jesus is going through our lives, Satan is accusing us for the person we are. We are naturally evil. We want to be separated from God. But even though we have fallen short of his glory, God gives us an opportunity to take a step forward. It takes an opportunity for us to be saved. That through our advocate, Jesus, who is in the most holy place, he is interceding for us and atoning for our sins. Only through Jesus, get this, only through Jesus we can be saved. Only through Jesus. Revelation 22, verse 11. This is a verse that I want you guys to go to. Revelation 22, verse 11. Revelation 22, verse 11. And I really want you to pay attention to this. Verse 11, and it reads... He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, 
let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. You see, the investigative judgment, it's for our benefit to know that God is just and loving, that he reveals to us who he really is, and that those who are professed Christians who have dipped into the pools of water and claim to be believers, all we have to do is continue believing in Jesus and learning more about his truth and accepting the light that God is giving us and being op- having the opportunities to learn more about him, we can be saved. And in the end, judgment god is not going to force us remember he gives us a choice he gives us a choice get this the judgment is not choosing who will who will be saved or lost but rather god recognizing those who have chosen to be saved or lost i'll read that again The judgment is not choosing who will be saved or lost, but rather God recognizing those have chosen to be saved or lost. I'm going to make an illustration. Um, Can I have two kids come up in the front for me? In the end, we learned that God gives us an opportunity to choose. And in judgment, it's not God making the verdict in your lives. It's us. So as one side, they already know we did this yesterday for family vespers. God is in the middle. Don't pull too hard. Don't pull too hard. This is us. This is what's happening in our lives. One person is trying to go towards God. And one person is trying to go towards their wicked wickedness. And all judgment is really is that he allows you to finally be sealed with the decision that you are making in your life. God is just only allowing what is really deep in your heart to be settled out in public. God is letting you choose your destiny. And as they are pulling towards God and pulling towards towards Satan, What God is doing is that when judgment comes and when he pronounces judgment, verdict, he's finally going to steal you for the decision that you have made for him. He's going to let you go and he's going to let you make the seal and decision for Jesus. Or he's going to let you go on the other side and let you go towards wickedness. In the end, thank you. In the end, we will be making a decision for our lives. In the end, we will be making a decision for our lives. The question as we start to close, I want to end with a video. The question is, are you at peace with God letting you have the destiny you are heading for? Are you at peace with the decision that you just made right now? You know what's going on in your hearts. You know the things that you've done in your lives. You know your righteous deed and your wicked, wicked deeds. You know what you are doing in your lives. Either you're wasting your time or you're doing things that are beneficial for your well-being. In the end... It is you that will decide if you want to be saved or not. In the end, God will only seal the decision that you already made in your heart. C.S. Lewis says this, There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, Thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, Thy will be done. Satan is accusing you right now. You could either believe in his lies 
But when we are in that courtroom, Jesus will reveal in his hands the scars he did for you and for me. What would it be like to actually go before a court hearing and stand trial for all the sins I've committed throughout my lifetime? Handcuffed in chains, I was escorted into the courtroom with the court session just minutes away from beginning. Then walked in the prosecutor. He looked like a perfectionist, a legalist, a man of the law. He seemed proud, arrogant, and aggressive. He carried stacks of files with him, records upon records of every sin I've ever committed in the past. My defense attorney was the next person to enter the court. He was here to defend the case on my behalf. But how can he proclaim his defense over a case I knew I was surely guilty of? The trial that will determine my destiny finally begins. The prosecutor states his side of the case before the court. In my hand are records of offenses that he committed. First, pride of self. Living I, in I couldn't bear it. He shows Countless up sins others. being read aloud. He thinks highly of himself. And hearing each defiling sin only increases my guilt even more. Swearing. I know his mother didn't raise him like that. With the same tongue you praise your Lord and Father and with it you curse men? I got it all right here on paper. Look at it. No, look at it! You've been living your life thinking you've got it all figured out. But I'm here to tell you, you've been living a lie. Your Honor, based on the evidence presented, I strongly affirm the defendant Eden Henry II guilty. It has come to that. My reputation, torn. My dignity, crushed. Hope now seemed so distant and so unreachable. I felt like I was in the center of chaos, confusion, and darkness. Your Honor, he doesn't deserve the death penalty. You see, I've seen his life during the good times and also the bad times, but there's something in him can motivate him to be a better person. I mean, with all I've done and, and throughout all my life, how could this person still love me for who I am? Even though I've turned my back on him so many times in the past, I hereby affirm that Eden Henry II is innocent and be pardoned from his past transgression. Objection, Your Honor. Can't you realize this man deserves a death sentence? His sins are too great. There's no way you can prove this man's innocence. Defense attorney, if you strongly believe in this man's innocence, what proof do you have? And silence fills the room and all eyes turn to the defense attorney. As of the case of Eden Henry II, who has been charged of transgression of the law, I, the judge, find the defendant not guilty. 
and pardon of all transgressions. Case closed. Pardon through his blood? Forgiveness through his blood? And redemption through his blood? It, it overpowers the influence of sin and captivates the soul. That's what it did for me. Knowing that Christ has given me the gift of salvation, I now have a newfound love and respect for him. From this day forward, I give my life to Christ. And I will live for Christ. And I will share with the world what Christ has done for me. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet perhaps even for a good man would one dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This video was recorded from Central Filipino Seventh-day Adventist Church to help prepare people for the soon return of Jesus Christ. If you would like to visit us and for more information, go to www.centralfilipino.org.